chciałam Państwa bardzo serdecznie przywitać, podziękować za przybycie tutaj do Akademii Sztuk Pięknych i podziękować Krzysztofowi Wilczyńskiemu, dziekanowi Wydziału Malarstwa za te gościny. Mam nadzieję, że to jest początek naszej dłuższej współpracy w dziedzinie wiedzy, w dziedzinie wykładów i chcemy jako Instytut Sztuki Wyspa od czasu do czasu właśnie umożliwić taką wizytę wybitnego artysty lub intelektualisty, który, który może wprowadzić nas w istotę swojej praktyki artystycznej. I powód, dla którego jest z nami dzisiaj Dieter Steyer, niemiecki artysta mieszkający w Berlinie, jest taki, że od dłuższego czasu obserwujemy jej praktykę artystyczną. Jest ona uczestniczką nadchodzącej wystawy Alternatywa 2012, która otwiera się 25 maja w hali 90 na terenie Stoczni Gdańskiej. Już bardzo serdecznie Państwa na tę wystawę zapraszamy. Jej praca, do której też częściowo nawiążę, to jest praca w przygotowaniu, praca w produkcji, będzie częścią wystawy Materiality, Materialność, która, która właśnie będzie w hali 90 b Jest to jedna z dwóch wystaw Alternatywa, które pokazujemy w maju tego roku, przez cały sezon letni do końca września. Częścią Alternatywa są nie tylko wystawy, ale również różnego rodzaju wykłady, warsztaty, ponieważ staramy się jakby poszerzyć to pole sztuki, którym się zajmujemy, o pole wiedzy, dlatego będzie, będziemy mieli szereg znakomitych gości w tym roku. Oprócz HITO swoje wykłady wygłoszą w tym roku Marcelo Esposito czy Emilio Moreno spośród artystów i spośród um, znanych kuratorów, którzy będą mieli swoje prezentacje publiczne, między innymi Oku Jędrzeza, który e, był dyrektorem artystycznym e, e, dokumenta Kasem e, 10 lat temu, e, e, który jest obecnie dyrektorem Hausen Kurs w Monarchium e, i w tej chwili otwiera w przyszłym tygodniu swoją wystawę i ten z Proximity w Paryżu. Będzie tam też kilkoro polskich artystów, częściowo z nich dzięki współpracy z Instytutem Sztuki Wyspa. Następnym gościem będzie Pascal Zile, który jest z kolei osobą, która bardzo intensywnie obserwuje ekonomię wokół sztuki. Będzie mówił o, o, o ekonomii Biennale i o tym, jak Biennale i różnego rodzaju wielkie blockbusterowe wystawy służą idei promowania miast, jak również napędzania ekonomii. Będzie się krytycznie przyglądał tym, temu właśnie utylizowaniu sztuki w takim kontekście. Będą, będzie też wykład Ili Terogo w jednej z chyba z tych innych widniejszych teoretyczek pola sztuki, też osoby, która ma chyba obecnie kluczowy wpływ na zbudowanie pola wiedzy z panem kuratorstwem i która Myślę, jest jedną z najbardziej wpływowych nauczycielek naszych czasów. Ja używam tego, tego sformułowania z pełnym przekonaniem. Nauczycielka właśnie, osoba, która na nowo pokazuje nam drogi działania dla artysty, dla intelektualisty, dla kuratora. To jest tylko część tego programu, który przygotowaliśmy dla Państwa do końca września, być może nawet 1 października tego roku. A teraz będę chciała oddać głos Hito, która sama też zajmuje się pedagogiką artystyczną, wykłada w uczelniach, wykłada na UDK w Berlinie, brała też udział w wielu projektach, projektach edukacyjnych w różnych krajach, między innymi na Polsce w Polsce w Londynie. I dla mnie jej praktyka jest bardzo interesująca do pokazania tutaj w Gdańsku i Państwu, dlatego że po pierwsze jest osobą, która pracuje pomiędzy różnymi dyscyplinami, bo ona wykształcona jest jako filmowiec, pracuje jako artysta w tej chwili, czyli porusza się między polem filmu, głównie filmu dokumentalnego i polem sztuki, także dlatego, że jej praktyka artystyczna jest bardzo mocno związana z, z badaniami, z poszukiwaniem wiedzy, z, to jest bardzo, są bardzo starannie przygotowane, długotrwałe procesy. Jest to coś innego co, niż to, co zazwyczaj kojarzymy ze studiem artysty. To są podróże badawcze, to są przeszukiwania archiwów, to są kontakty z ludźmi itd., co w którymś momencie doprowadza do powstania tego dzieła filmowego. Ona 
i praktyka jest głównie w dziedzinie filmu i w ogóle obrazu rejestrowanego. Także myślę, że ponieważ to nie są wątki bardzo dobrze znane w, tutaj w italijskim środowisku artystycznym, także w praktykach pedagogicznych, także myślę, że to będzie dla nas bardzo ciekawe i otwierające. Dziękuję bardzo i zapraszam do wykład Hiebersztajem. Sorry again for the delay and all the technical problems. Maybe Aneta told you already, I'm a documentary filmmaker by profession and I was trained as a documentary filmmaker and this is in fact the practice that underlies all that I'm doing. And for the obvious reasons, because let's say more experimental documentary filmmaking started to be uh, stopped to be funded by the usual circuits of production like television and so on, I somehow found myself in the art context and um, I started to work more in video installation, also expanding it into different fields. Now, <laughs> it's a bit um, unfortunate because I wanted to show you many videos. This seems to be the part that seems not to be working. Um, but never mind, I will go into the more installational part of my work and try to explain it from there. And also while I was sitting there waiting, I remembered that most, uh, many, many of the great films have been made using photographs. So it's still images. I don't know if you know Chris Marquet's film, seminal, seminal film, uh, La Jeté. Oh, the computer is talking to me. So should I just say okay? Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe it's I will learn Polish during this lecture, I hope. Um, anyhow, I was telling you about this photo film by Chris Marquet à La Jeté, a wonderful film made in the early 70s which uses only still photographs. So what I've tried to do is only use still photographs, or almost only, um, in order to explain some of my filmic practices. So this actually is still um, from one of the recent projects I completed, which is called The Kiss. And The Kiss started from a very simple and yet a bit uncanny idea, namely the idea that every kiss is something which has reached us via let's say, a long line of transfers. The kiss may end up, you know, in our face or in somebody's, on somebody's lips or in somebody's face or wherever, but before that, it has been passed on, you know, from mouse to mouse to mouse to cheek to whatever. And it's something which works almost like a coin or a medium or a photograph or a letter or a word, or anything, it travels on. It travels in time, it travels in space, it connects the most different people, and if you follow the path of a kiss, then um, you might find that the origin of the kiss you're getting, um, or giving, is in fact something you would never have imagined. And the idea of the kiss as a virus or something which is passed on like a gift or even the contrary of a gift, something really horrible, that's also possible. And that was the starting point for this project because um, I was thinking that maybe every kiss I saw on the street were like the illegitimate offspring, or let's say the last version of one kiss that happened um, about 20, 20, 18 years ago, uh, in 1993, at a train station in Bosnia Herzegovina. Now, this story I'm telling you is something that comes from footnotes, from legal documents, which never have even been translated to English. So it's a story which is completely at the margins of written history and that almost didn't catch anybody's attention, but it's a story of a kiss which never left me in a way. In 1993, there was a train 
traveling from Belgrade um, in Serbia to, to Bar in Montenegro, and there was seven kilometers in which it was traveling through uh, Bosnian territory, and the war had already started. So it happened that the train was stopped during these seven kilometers, and 20 passengers were taken from the train and kidnapped. And none of these passengers was ever seen alive again. Now there's at least two very unusual <coughs> things about this incident, which is otherwise not unusual at all. I mean, people did get kidnapped and killed. It was rather, let's say, default practice. But in this case, there was something really unusual, namely, um, the fact that only 19 of these people, <coughs> namely their identities and their names and who they were, are known. For 19, we know the names, the relatives, the address, you know, all the details. All of them were men between, I think, 16 and 56 years old. But for the 20s, we have almost no information. We have hardly any information whatsoever because the existence of this 20th person was only conveyed to us via three witnesses who saw this person being led away on the train station. And they say that this was a black man who was taken away. Other than that, we have absolutely no information. And there is another detail which says that um, when he was taken away, the leader of the paramilitary gang of kidnappers, tapped him on, on the shoulder, said, here is my brother, and kissed him. And after that, we have no more information about any of these people. So I was, this, this was sort of the underlying fantasy of the whole work, that every kiss we see now is somehow a kiss that has been passed down from that situation and that even though we have no idea of what happened to these people, least of all the you know, mysterious black man of whom we do not even know the name, the only thing that escaped from this situation, which is a sort of material evidence or witness, but a mute witness, a witness which cannot speak, is the kiss itself which managed you know, to escape the situation, to get away from the situation. Now, what I did is um, to use, to, to try to recreate this incident, this kiss, this event, be three witness testimonies, which are between two and three sentences long, so it's almost nothing. And they describe the situation when um, the kiss is given or taken. Um, and the technology I used is kind of unusual because it's a technology that police uses nowadays, not every police force but many police forces in the world, use to document crime sites and to record evidence. What kind of technology is it? It's a 3D laser scanner. Maybe you have seen this sort of device. It's, a, <laughs> it's huge. Um, it looks like an old-fashioned, you know, um, large format um, um, camera, photo camera. It's set on a tripod and it rotates really slowly to scan a, a space in 360 degrees. And what it does is that it sends out laser beams and they are being reflected. So each, let's say, point in space is being measured. Th there are measurements for where uh, each point in space is. And thus, the space gets scanned. And you can, of course, set the resolution and all of that. But what you get, essentially, is a 3D point cloud of a space in which every element is measured and fixed. So you know you have a sort of a 3D representation of a space. And police uses it because they believe, or also the companies that manufacture these devices believe, that this is now the ultimate documentary um, tool, a tool that will produce 
100% true evidence and also it will capture it forever and then you can walk through the site in 3D and then you can do animations, all of these tools are very interesting for the police to use. So they use it to, as a forensic tool, they use it to scan crime sites. The interesting thing is that it is of course a still camera, it cannot capture motion. It's a, it's a scanner that rotates really, really, really slowly, 360 degrees around, and if anything moves, then it will be completely blurred. <laughs> Which means that you can document anything but a crime with this device. It really works like this ancient still photography, meaning that if anything moves, then it will be blurred. And thus it's of course completely, um, um, it's completely incompetent in a way of um, capturing any sort of documentary reality. But still, um, it's, it's extremely interesting because it's so loaded with this myth of capturing you know, uh, true evidence of crime sites. So um, this technology produces really interesting images which are translucent, which look like clouds. And um, if, you, if you look at them, you will also see these blue shapes which are produced by the um, camera flying through this kind of scenery, flying through this kind of scan. And this is the kind of representation which is being produced when you try to capture a scene using this type of police tool, this kind of you know, forensic, um, forensic technology. Um, there is one other thing which is really interesting in this technology. It's called a 3D technology, but obviously um, it's, it's a 2.5D technology, meaning that if you want to capture something really in 3D, then you have to um, film it or scan it from every direction. Now, police usually doesn't have three scanners, they have one, meaning that they do not capture, they cannot capture the back of the shapes. So what they actually get is, um, is a hollow surface which has no back. And in the animation, you can fly around to the back and see that there is a hollow shell, there is nothing inside. And what becomes visible on the back of the surface is actually the missing of data and the missing of information and the lack of information. It's the space, you know, where an object covers the view. It's a space which is shadowed or which is cut or which is, um, which is incomplete, so to speak. And this was also an, a very important reason why I thought that this technology is extremely, even though it does obviously not capture reality or documentary truths or evidence, what it does capture indeed and strikingly is the missing itself. It's the missing of the information. It's the missing of the part of the body. It's also the missing in this story specifically of the people themselves. So the missing people are captured using a technology in which you can really see, un unlike in a 2D photograph, you, know, you can fly around and see, we have no information for this part. We have no information for the back. We don't know what's going on there, in fact. But in a 2D photograph, that would be covered. Whereas in this type of 3D representation, all the lacks and um, all the, let's say, gaps within representation become gapingly um, apparent. And this is what the kiss actually looks like. You see, <laughs> this is a person that moves, so it gets absolutely blurred, and uh, you see that basically you do not see a lot. So even if you try to capture this event with the most accurate documentary and forensic technology, you cannot manage to get, you know, to the to the core of the event itself. It um, eludes representation, and obviously, I mean, this is absolutely not the only 3D technology available. There's lots of other, you know, versions and um, and and um, 
well, techniques to do that, but this would be the one which is used in order to capture documentary data for crime scene investigations. And there is another um, part to this, which is also very interesting if we think about 3D as a documentary tool, because until now, if we, if, if we consider taking a documentary image, a photograph or a video, just anything, it would come out in 2D, it would be a picture or an image. Whereas now, with this type of scans and with these point clouds, one can in fact model an object, which is like a facsimile of the situation. It's something like a documentary sculpture of the event. Now if I say this, it sounds much easier than it actually is, because in fact it's really, really complicated, and you have to model you know, all the shapes and the meshes by hand, and the object which is created is much more fictional than you believe, because it relies a lot on the interpretation of the person who does the modeling. That, that's one thing. But just imagine, you know, it were possible to scan something and to do a one-to-one one, one one scale um, replica or facsimile of this situation. Just imagine this, this were possible, it might be possible. Then still, you would have a lot of white shadows in, 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 this, um, in, this, in this sculpture, which is all the parts which have been covered. You know? Just like in the, um, in, in the point cloud animation, which I showed you before, the same appears in 3D. You have these shadows, which are in effect blanks. You have um, persons which are hollowed out, the whole back, you know, of these uh, persons is just like an empty shell. There is no body. Yeah, it's just a surface. And of course, um, anything that is moving becomes an abstract blur. It becomes just a line, a line um, in space, which shows movement, um, but nothing else. And this is, um, in fact, a, a 3D scan. I did, um, in fact, produce from this situation, which shows <laughs> the movement produced by the kiss, which becomes just like an abstract wave in space, um, and the witnesses looking on, um, which are followed out. If I was to show you the video, uh, you would see that the music comes from this very um, famous old Japanese film. Do we have a sound feedback? Yes, the sound of the sea and of wind and waves. Mm. Is it from my microphone? Okay. No, I think it's from the back of the Ah, okay. Okay, so the music um, comes from this um, very famous old Japanese film called Rashomon by um, Kurosawa Akira, which uh, also talks about the story of a crime committed in 11th century Japan in a forest, and several witnesses are talking about it without and, and giving completely different and divergent informations, which is actually interesting because this film, I mean, I, I'm sure you all have heard about it, um, has become so paradigmatic in its treatment of witnesses and documentary information that a legal term has been invented, which is called the Rashomon effect, which deals with the phenomenon that um, witnesses will say different things in court, which they usually do. Um, some installation shots from when that installation, the kiss, was uh, shown. Okay. Now, now it becomes a bit more difficult. Let me just try to, I, I, will, I will briefly talk about that. I wanted to show you the video, it would have been much clearer, but um, maybe I will talk about it just in order to introduce something else. This is a video I did um, in 2004, which is called November, and it deals with two different sets of images, one of them being images from the first Super 8 film I ever made, 
um, when I was 17 with a group of girls. We um, stole some Super 8 spools and we made a Super 8 film in which there would be three girls um, trying to beat up as many male persons as they could get hold of. And that was the film. There was nothing more to it. And the main character of the film actually was killed um, 15 years later in Turkey. Um, she had joined the PKK, which is the underground um, militant organization by Kurdish separatists in Turkey. She had joined their women's army and her unit got trapped in a firefight and um, she was taken prisoner and apparently she was executed after being, having been taken prisoner. So in that sense, this is another case of a missing person. And what was interesting for me in that film and that whole investigation was not who she was, not who, what, why she went underground or um, what sort of psychological motivation was, but mainly in trying to talk about images of heroes, especially female heroines, and martyr. What is the connection between you know, popular culture images of heroes, of heroines, and martyrs, and this kind of imagery here, which is very, let's say, stereotypical um, depiction of how a hero or a heroine could look like. And I, in this film, I was talking a lot about traveling images, about images which, like the kiss I told you before, are sort of passed on from hand to hand, images in this case of my friend as a hero, as a poster girl, as a motorcycle girl, as a, you know, exploitation film, martial arts film, heroine, all these kind of different um, images um, were compared to each other and in a way analyzed or described, let's say, described as traveling images, as images which, you know, underwent um, a lot of different migrations before they, uh, and they never stopped to travel. Um, I continued this investigation with some sort of sequel which um, continued this idea of the traveling image because after I had talked so much about images of this girl who was called Andrea Wolf, um, I realized that there was, or must be at this point, another image subtitled Andrea which would show something entirely different, namely it would show myself, age 21, um, tied up in what is called Japanese rope bondage, which as you surely all know, is some sort of subgenre of Japanese pornography, in a, let's say, rather unclosed situation. And this would be me, tied up, and it would have the caption, Andrea. How did I know? Well, why? Why did this picture exist in the first place? Um, when I went to film school in Japan, I had these very radical documentary film teachers who always told me to go out and, you know, to do uh, the most um, precarious undercover investigation. So, in fact, I went and I tried to make a documentary about this sort of scene, which at that time was quite, let's say, underground and very much do dominated by the Japanese mafia. In fact, I think it partly still is. And they used lots of imported labor, so to speak, migrant labor. The conditions were really, really terrible. It was an awful place. Anyhow, in order to go there, or to introduce myself, I had to use a different name. And for some reason, I used the name of my best friend at that time, Andrea, because it was less dangerous, or it was too dangerous to use my own name. And 
The only reason is that I thought that this would be the only person who was courageous and brave enough to do this kind of thing. Anyhow, I ran away very quickly because it turned out to be much too dangerous for me. But I knew that there was a photograph somewhere which showed me in this kind of situation. And then I had the idea to go back to Japan and to look for that photograph, knowing very well that I would never be able to find it because there's billions of this type of photograph being produced every year. Um, and everybody told me it would be absolutely impossible to find it. The fact is that I found it 24 hours after landing at Tokyo airport because it had been archived, in a huge archive, which contained basically everything and it was not difficult at all to find. And I was very embarrassed, but I still had to do the film, which I did, and which happened to center on my assistant called Ageha, in fact, who was, um, or still is, who was doing the same job at that time. She is a bondage model, but she developed something which is entirely different, um, namely what uh, she calls a practice of self-suspension where she ties herself up basically and suspends herself into the air looking much more like somebody who's flying and floating than anybody who would be tied up um, and helpless and you know, subject to some sort of uh, desire of a master. So this, um, this film ended up being completely centered um, on her as a character and how she was um, how she was navigating essentially the conditions of this scene and of this profession. And um, this is what I'm doing now, which is in fact um, going back to the first version or the first the, the, the first November film, the first film about Andrea Wolf, because at that point in time Nobody knew where that battle had taken place and how she had been killed. And this became known um, a few months ago. Um, suddenly, the scene of the battle was made public. And I went there. And what I'm trying to do, I mean, if, I, if I say I went there, then I have to say that it's actually more or less impossible to go there. But somehow, we went. It's very up, high up in the mountains, and it's an area which is still, you know, at the moment, very intensely riddled by airstrikes, all sorts of military interventions. And I'm working um, now on producing a 3D model of that site, very similar to what you saw in the KISS, but um, also under much more difficult conditions because in the case there was a recreation, you know, of, of something which was more or less under control. Here nothing is under control and um, it's proving much more difficult to do this. This is why I'm having to use um, lots of different representations of a scene which proves in essence um, quite impossible to represent. Now I will give up on trying to describe videos. <laughs> I will move to something else, which is um, which you see as it is, as it was installed, actually. And this is something which came out from being a filmmaker, in essence, and um, and and thinking through how, again, the question of documentary, what do we see when we see a documentary image? What does it mean? And what would it mean if we interpret a monochrome image as a documentary image and a documentary image of what? Now, let me try to explain how I, um, how, how I, I, I started thinking about that because it really started when I saw 
a video of the invasion of Iraq in 2003, and there was this person riding on an armored vehicle, a CNN reporter, and he was completely um, jubilant. He had a cell phone and he stuck it out of the window and he said, you have never seen anything like that. Wiegelkuhn was riding through the desert. And in fact, all that one could see on the screen was a completely abstract image which looked something like that. Because obviously this was one of the first live cell phone broadcasts and there was no bandwidth, and this was all pixelated. I think now we got more or less used to this kind of image, but at that point in time it was indeed um, quite new and quite radical. And we pointed out a, a kind of really, um, really urgent paradox, namely that those documentary images in the news that we believe to be extremely real and live, and in the middle of the situation itself, that these were indeed completely abstract. So the more real it got, the more abstract it would look like. And this kind of relation between abstraction and the documentary started um, fascinating me. How come that abstraction has become the most um, real or truthful or authentic looking um, representation of documentary reality. And this is also what I found, which looks more or less like the picture that um, was seen on CNN, which is actually, of course, a camouflage pattern. And it is a, the camouflage pattern of the US Marine Corps, which is also pixelated. And, of course, they use it to blend into an environment which is already being seen by video technology. So they do not try to look like a tree or rock or a desert, but they try to look like a video image. They try to look like a pixelated video image because this is a way to blend into reality. Adapting to reality means become a video image. And um, this is the um, origin of this work here, which is called Red Bird, um, in which I tried again to seek through the relation of the documentary and abstraction. Um, Red Bird, these are three Apple cinema screens, 30 inch, hung uh, vertically next to each other. Now, I refer to them as a translation a new, media, a new media translation of this seminal work from 1921 by Alexander Rochenko, which is called Pure Red Color, Pure Yellow Color, Blue, uh, Pure Blue Color. And with this work he wrote that he had taken painting to its conclusion, to its end. It didn't go any further than that. This was the end of what he thought that painting was primary colors, a representation of primary colors. And um, my idea was that at this point in time, and we're talking about 2007, there is only one primary color, which, ah, which comes up now. Um, this is the color scale that existed at this time um, made by the U.S. Homeland Security Office, which showed um, the color code for the threat level from terrorist attacks. So you see low is green, there's a low risk of terrorist attacks, and this color here is severe, which means that there would be a severe risk of terrorist attacks. In 2007, um, the um, set or the official threat level was at severe for 10 months throughout the whole year, meaning that it was almost always at this level. So the, the idea was that at this time there would be only one um, primary color, namely this red, 
that the three primary colors had been replaced by this one primary color of fear, if you like, and also of the intensity of fear, and also of a kind of addiction to fear, if you like, and that every documentary image that we were seeing, every news image, was sort of um, um, the, this red was invisibly underlying any sort of documentary image we saw, even if we didn't notice it. It was like a sort of filter through which we were seeing our reality and it had become so normal that we couldn't see it anymore. This monochrome red in which something had come to its end, also a moving image had come to its end and had been frozen and paralyzed in fear. This was kind of the idea that I tried to convey with Red Alert, but it got completely out of control, and then I started liking it much more. Because when it was first shown, um, there was absolutely no explanation whatsoever going with it, which is fine. Which led to the fact that many visitors really didn't know what to do with this work. Um, perfectly understandable. There is nothing to do. So many of the visitors tried to look behind screens and to see whether there was anything behind those screens. And this um, gesture was picked up by one press photographer um, who captioned it and wrote something like, is there anything behind it? And this picture became, I don't know, the picture of the day of the German press agency, and from there it went into the world, and it became viral for a day, of course, um, which led to a whole range of people repeating this gesture in front of the artwork, and it became a very popular photo opportunity, and people would do just anything in front of these screens, especially looking behind it and seeing whether there was anything else which they had missed when they looked behind that work. So what I did is I went online and there were literally um, at least at that time a hundred of these amateur photographs and also by now people have done painting on different sorts of versions of it. And I collected these photos and recombined them into an animation where actually all these different movements would start to move, sort of morph into one continuous movement so that this frozen monochrome, you know, which talked about paralysis and fear and you know, being, being um, paralyzed, that this started moving again. But it was not my work anymore, but it had been processed through the points of view of at least a hundred different photographers who had taken this picture just as if I had taken, just like I had taken their picture to recombine it into this sort of animation. This was Red Alert 2. Um, now, yeah, maybe I will briefly talk about that. It's also not a film work, but also derives from this ongoing fascination with traveling images, and especially their condition online, their digital existence, their digital forms of existence. Now, um, what is this? It's, a, it's one, um, one example from a series I did, which is called The War According to eBay. Um, just trying to see. Oh, okay. 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 So you see, it's just abstract dots and shapes on a white background. So what is it? Um, on eBay, there is a quite large market for amateur photographs, historical amateur photographs of World War II. And this is due to the fact that all these you know, private photo albums and photo archives of the generation who actually took the pictures 
is now being dissolved, is being thrown out, is being kicked out in the streets, or, I don't know, taken to second-hand dealers. And this leads to the fact that there is a market which has developed for this kind of photographs. And, of course, as things grow, the more, let's say, dramatic and also cruel um, and violent the things depicted in the picture are, the more the price will go up for the pictures. So what I did is to, um, to, to collect lots of these pictures, but to focus only on one aspect of them, namely the copyright watermarks on these images. And there's two reasons why people would put copyright watermarks on them. One of them being that they want to um, prohibit copy and paste. So they want to put something on the picture so that it will become useless for people who don't buy it. You have to buy it. It's property. It's private property. You cannot simply download it or copy and paste it. The other reason is that, of course, on eBay, um, the use of Nazi symbols, for example, but also the depiction of graphic violence is prohibited. So very often these signs will also cover scenes which are extremely violent or should not be seen. And maybe I can find this one. What I did is to produce a series of these very minimalist and abstract looking um, light boxes. Here, I hope it will come up now. Yep. Yes, yep. here. Yeah, like this. Which show nothing but the copyright signs on them. These would be some of the originals from which I have taken um, the copyright signs. And the captions would give the exact you know, <laughs> eBay details, meaning that the content will be described quite in detail on eBay. So in a way, from the name, you can see what you cannot see on the picture, because I removed the photographic information to leave only the copyright signs for them. Mm. More, more abstract works. Yes, this is also kind of similar to this one, to this work, which also deals with the idea of abstraction and also deals with uh, historical, with the historical period of World War II, um, and the idea that um, the idea in fact of materiality as addressed in Aneta's upcoming um, show in at Vispa oh, this computer has its own life okay I hope it will stay there what is this and what is the pattern on the facade this is actually a current art academy in Linz in Austria which is one of the few let's say, nationalist, socialist, national, social Nazi buildings that were completed um, shortly after World War II, in fact. Um, you might all know that there were you know, grandiose plans to redevelop Linz as a sort of Nazi cultural capital of Europe, including museums and operas and whatnot. And there were lots of paintings stolen all over Europe to go into these museums. But because of the war, very few of those buildings were actually completed. And this building, which um, happened to be a tax office, in fact, and which is set on Main Square in Linz, is actually one of the few buildings that um, were completed because it was built right after the so-called, after the annexion or this very voluntary annexion of Austria. So what is the pattern on the building? The whole project starts from one idea, which is very simple, um, and which starts from the fact that when I started to ask very simple questions about this building, nobody had an answer, and the questions were like, 
who built this building? I mean, who were the workers who built this building? Nobody knew that. Uh, what were the materials with which the building was built? Nobody knew this. Um, what, what are these stones here? Very, very simple questions. Which people lived here? Um, one of the reasons why nobody knew this was that it had been planned more or less from Berlin and most of the historical documents were in Berlin and nobody had ever looked at them before. But on the other hand, it really gave me the idea that one had to uncover the stones themselves to let them talk, you know, to let them talk, the, uh, tell the story of their own construction and also that one had to remove the facade from that building, even if partially, to let the building you know, tell the story of who made it and how it was made and using what materials. So we, me and my assistant, who is a historian, we delved into a very extended uh, and also quite obsessive and, and uh, overdone research which lasted a while and took us over 17 archives. Anyhow, we came up with this diagram of movements of materials and people who contributed to the building who, or who, on the contrary, were expelled because of the building, who were driven away, uh, sometimes uh, killed or driven into exile. And this map spanned several continents and um, was quite extensive and it is based on the stories of let's say of 40 different people who either happened to be um, forced laborers drafted to build that building or um, were stonemasons in the adjacent concentration camp of Nordhausen who were involved in, um, in, in making those grey stones which you see here and so on and so on. And um, this pattern was further abstracted and then developed into this kind of, um, uh, let's call it a, a plan or a map, which was then inscribed into the facade. Um, and in the basement of the building, um, we put five double channel video installations which would get, give them precise information about those routes which had been, um, let's say, put or sculptured, sculpted, sculpted into the building. And these were, let's say, the time-based versions of the pattern which, can be, which could be seen on the facade itself. There was one very, very uncanny detail which emerged during that research and which actually I think about in every art academy I enter. Because this is now an art academy, of course, and it turned out during that research that the radiators from the concentration camp in Mauthausen had been deinstalled after the war because there was a shortage of everything. So they were brought to the building and they still are inside the building. And, of course, there were not a lot of um, places where there was any heating in Mauthausen. There was, of course, no heating in the uh, prisoners' barracks and so on. But one of the few places where there was a heating uh, was actually in the prisoners' brothel. So every time I think about this, uh, every time I enter a new art academy, sort of looking at the infrastructure <laughs> in order to see where that could come from. Um, um, yes, maybe just one last project. This is again a video and it deals again with the idea of thinking through material, where does material come from and where does it go? Um, what are the materials that we use every day? What sort of histories, what sort of material histories do they have? And this is in fact um, a picture I took on an airplane graveyard in California and I saw a similar picture in the Financial Times at the beginning of the financial crash 2008 and 
um, the story was more or less that in times of financial crisis, planes would be grounded because it was too expensive to keep them flying. So they would be parked in this kind of you know, parking lots or airports um, until you know, the, the crisis ended. But the other planes, obviously, especially the ones which consumed lots of fuel, um, would also be recycled for parts mainly, but also for aluminum, for scrap metal. And they would be you know, dismantled, uh, shipped off to China, melted down, and recycled. But in this specific graveyard, there was also another possibility of recycling the planes, because it was located next to Hollywood. So um, big uh, film companies would go there and shoot action scenes in which plane would be blown up. Uh, or, I don't know, music videos in which Robbie Williams would be stood on the wing of an airplane. Or, I don't know, hijacking scenes where the SWAT team comes into the uh, cockpit and, I don't know, blows off the clock cockpit or dangles from the wings or stuff like this. So my idea was that a contemporary recycling scenario might look like that. Um, there's an airplane, there's a financial crisis, the airplane gets grounded, gets drawn from circulation. Um, it, will, it is decided that it's too old to keep flying, so next it will be blown up for a Hollywood film. And this is actually uh, seen from the film Speed, made in the 80s sometime, uh, in which a Boeing 707 is blown up. So after that happens, the debris is collected, shipped off to China, melted down, and then it is being applied onto a DVD because you need a reflexive layer in each DVD and in many cases it's made of aluminum. And then in the last step, there would be a pirated version of the film in which the plane is blown up, being burned onto the DVD, and the DVD sent somewhere. So that essentially the DVD, no, that the film in which the plane explodes is burned onto, you know, the remnants of the plane itself. It was a sort of Möbius band-like loop of recycling and I decided to follow that loop and came up with something, with a concept that a Soviet writer called Sergei Tretyakov came up with in the 30s, which is called the biography of the object. And at that point, he argued that you know, one shouldn't focus on individual subjects, on psychologies, on heroes, that all of this was completely boring in relation to the stories of objects which were manufactured on conveyor belts, thus articulating and combining many, many different histories uh, like nodes through which energy flowed. And now embellishing the story, this is not what Tretyakov wrote. <laughs> this is what I now invented, what he could have written. And decided to follow um, the story of some of the airplanes, and this is the last thing I'm going to um, say now. Um, one of the stories which did not go into the film. This is one of the planes which ended as scrap on this airplane graveyard, a Boeing 707, um, which was made in the 70s and immediately after bought by Ethiopian Airlines. Very. Um, Soon after it was bought, it got hijacked by some Ethiopian separatists, actually Eritrean separatists, including a girl called Marta Mimratu. And a, 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 a firefight took place um, in the skies because there were sky marshals on board which were armed. So you had on the one hand the hijackers, on the other hand uh, uh, sky marshals, and they were shooting at each other in full flight across a party of 14 British bird watchers who had boarded also the plane for certain reasons, and an American college professor called Roderick Hilsinger. 
uh, actually managed to land somewhere safely. And uh, this is the rendition of this story in this magazine, which is, of course, um, framed by 60s advertisement for Mark Reams and Catholic dictionaries, while Mr. Hils Hilsinger explains how he was trained to deal with that grenade. He said, I, have, I had no specific grenade instruction in the Navy, like anyone who grew up. Uh, he got his basic training in disposing of hand grenades through all those great Z war movies. I saw just enough John Wayne movies to know you just can't sit there and look at it. So he got his training, obviously, from John Wayne, who coincidentally died, it is said, it is said, of the effects of this nuclear bomb here, because he starred in this movie, which is repeatedly being called the worst movie of all times, where he's playing Genghis Khan. And um, um, not only him, but also the main actress, as well as the director, died because they were said to have been affected by the nuclear bomb test which took place at the same time in the Nevada desert. And for some reason, um, this specific bomb was called Dirty Harry. Um, but the reason why I'm telling you all of this is not because of John Wayne, but because of this person here called Howard Hughes. And you might have heard of him, there also was a Hollywood film recently, um, extolling his life and his biography. He was a film director and a film producer, but he also was an airplane fanatic. He was a pilot. I think he crashed several, uh, he crashed several times himself. But in his later life, he also became, uh, let's say, airplane engineer, a airplane developer. He had several companies who developed um, airplane technology and to come back to that story of the Boeing, the Boeing 707, it was Howard Hughes who bought that Boeing that got hijacked in Ethiopia uh, by Marta Mebratu and her gang of separatists. And Howard Hughes redeveloped it into this unit, which is called an airborne infrared measurement system. Again, something like a flying scanner, if you wish and which was designed for electronic target recognition. Now, to us, it looks completely obvious, you know, but this is the kind of imagery, of aerial imagery that was developed, and that was sometime in the very early 80s. So you can really look at the prototypes of the sort of imagery that we got used to um, in recent times. And Howard Hawks actually developed these planes, or redeveloped it, he transformed it into a camera, which included this flying eye, which would scan and record the territory under it. And Howard Hughes also gave the plane a new name and called it Embraceable Annie. And this is the name which you also see written here on the cockpit after it got uh, crashed up and uh, for metal at the same airplane graveyard in Mojave that I showed you before. And this is what sparked the fantasy of you know, the DVD and this eternal feedback loop um, of aluminum in this site. I think I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention.